Okay, in the last video we looked at some motivation concepts and we looked at hunger. We're going to move on now and look at sexual motivation. Sex is a very big part of human beings. It's a drive that we have. Otherwise, none of us would be here looking at it. It's a drive that helps us increase. It helps us procreate, gives us more people. Okay, so... First of all, we'll look at the sexual response cycle. Sex has been something, you know, that people didn't talk about a lot. And then back in the 50s and stuff, it started with a guy named uh, uh, Kinsey who did a report. And then carrying on from that was Masters and Johnson. I know, unfortunate names. Um, but they looked at the sexual response cycle. So what they did is they actually got people. They paid the money to be in research to either masturbate or actually engage in a sexual act while they were hooked up to machines. I know, weird, huh? Would you do that? Um, anyways, to see what it was. So their sampling was people that are willing to do that, but they had more, you know, 10,000 responses that they've actually measured. And they came up with this sensual res sexual response cycle, which says that we begin with an excitement phase. This is where blood engorges the genital regions, females secrete uh, a lubricant, and uh, of course, males become erect. Um, the breathing intensifies and it leads into a plateau phase where this intensity continues, it builds up even more until it reaches orgasm, uh, at which point um, it, it's sort of like it, it's relieved at that point. The, the blood goes down, the breathing and everything stops if orgasm has occurred. If it has not occurred, it happens more slowly, much like a sneeze. When you feel like you got a sneeze, if you, the sneeze comes out, it drops quickly. Um, same thing with orgasm. If the sneeze doesn't happen, it decreases a lot slower okay then we enter a re uh, resolution phase where all of the all of these things reverse themselves okay a refractory period is that time where there needs to be a brief moment or even a long moment especially for males to achieve another um, orgasm or ejaculation um, which can you know be minutes to you know day kind of thing before that they're able to do that so masters and johnson's did this kinds of research they also, we also look at, you know, sexual dysfunction because we want to find out, you know, how sexual activity works. We also want to find out what's wrong with it and, and try to help people with those things. So we have certain uh, problems. We have erectile disorder uh, where, you know, males cannot maintain an erection. All sexual dysfunctions are things that will interfere with um, sexual activity. Premature ejaculation, ejaculating before that they are... Um, satisfied with their sexual experience. Female orgasmic disorders often it can be accompanied with females to have pain or not achieving uh, orgasm very often or at all. And of course the paraphilias are all those things that you know these people have this the sexual impulses but they are not um, directed in a normal way. Uh, for example exhibitionism, fetishism, pedophilia, um, in order to be considered a disorder, it has to be a person's experiences distress from their unusual sexual interest, or it can cause harm, okay, or risk or harm to others. Um, probably should mention with the uh, motive, sexual motivation, it's a motivation drive, just like hunger. Um, the difference, of course, is that with sexual motivation, with sex, it's hunger. If you don't eat, you're going to die. If you don't have sex, you're not going to die. Despite how people may feel or tell you, they are not going to die if sex does not happen. So it doesn't. It's a little bit different in that respect. However, it works the same way as as far as the motivation goes. The hormones play a big part the, with the physio physiology. Um, of course, you know testosterone. When we reach puberty, and the estrogen development um, increases our sexual desire and our ability to have sexual intimacy. Um, estrogen obviously is the hormone, uh, the female sex hormone. Testosterone is the male sex hormone. And it seems to make a difference how much testosterone, especially with women. Um, when women have more testosterone, they seem to be more sexually interested. And you know, you think of animals in the wild, they're more sexually interested around the time of, of menstruation, around the time that they're able to have children. And this is when you know when animals we say where they would go into heat. With people, it's a little bit different. Um, however, we do find that the female is more interested in sexual activity around the time of ovulation because that is a the time they can get more preg they can get more pregnant, they can get pregnant more easily. 
Uh, when we introduce testosterone to females that say have had hysterectomies um, or are lacking testosterone, we find that their sexual interest peaks. It, it, impre it, it doesn't peak, but it, it gets stronger. However, with males, we find that extra testosterone doesn't really um, change their sexual motivation. Um, males are more interest, interested sexually than women, which makes an evolutionary sense, which makes evolutionary sense. Darwin's probably right in this case. Um, but for, for guys, it's, it's almost like, uh, you know, if you have a car and you have gas in the tank, it's going to work. If you put in more gas, it's still going to work, but it's not going to change the effectiveness. There's also external factors to sexual motivation. Um, are they good or are they bad? Well, external stimulus um, can actually make people, you know, um, sexually turned on. Uh, the use of pornography and, and, you know, like sexually explicit photos or, or scantily clad people. And most of it is directed toward males. However, we found it actually has the same effect on females. They are just as aroused by this kind of stuff, but apparently males are probably more willing to pay um, for that type of material. Um, it's, it's interesting to note too, that when we look at the experience as far as like orgasm for males and females, the response seems to be the same. The feeling seems to be the same. Uh, when we had researchers try to sort out written descriptions of what orgasm felt like between males and females, um, experts could not differentiate which descriptions came from males and which descriptions came from females. So it is very similar. And actually with fMRI scans, when we look at this information, it's the same areas of the brain. So the feeling is very likely uh, very similar to both of them. During orgasm, of course, um, they found, Masters and Johnson found that all of the um, muscles in the body actually will, will tense up. Well, you know what I mean. Okay. Um, also with imagined stimuli, dreams. Um, dreams can lead to sexual arousal. We find in males that uh, erection occurs even in non-sexual um, type of dreams in different l levels of sleep. And we also find that males have more sexual dreams than females do. Again, probably relating to Darwin's theory of evolution. Uh, as males, of course, can father as many children as they're, you know, infinite, basically, where females are limited as they have a limited amount of eggs that are sloughed. And once they are gone, that's as many children as they can have. And while they're pregnant, they can't get pregnant again. And we also find that males also engage in more sexual fantasies than females. Also, with all this external stimulus, it can actually lead to sexual problems. Um, we find that especially... It, you know, things that look like sexually coerciveness towards females tends to lead to more aggression in males towards females because they depict things, you know, for in an extreme where a female is raped and they seem to like it in that sort of media that it leads that to that male having that type of idea about it or, you know, making them immune to that idea that, that females may like to be coerced. Um, the other part of it is when we're exposed to all kinds of, you know, these beautiful people that are, you know, scantily clad and everything else, it can lead to difficulties in or, or rating our partners, our girlfriends, our boyfriends, our, our spouses as being less attractive um, because of that kind of stimulation that we have had. So it can cause problems that way. You know, we also look at social motivation. People are social animals. Um, many of the things that we do have to do with the people around us and how we behave around them and, and how it works. So we're going to look at the evidence that points to our human affiliation need, our, which is our need to belong, and how social networking also influences us as far as social media and in-person um, networking. So again, people are a social animal, as Aristotle said long, long, long ago. We have an affiliation need. We need to feel like we belong. We are hurt when we are not. When we don't belong, we don't feel good about things. So the social belonging is important. Why? Because it may enhance survival. You know, especially prehistorically, it's good to be around other people. They're a protective source. Uh, we learn from them. We can protect ourselves when we're around other people. So again, there's an evolutionary advantage to this. Um, 
it can also influence our thoughts and our emotions. Um, with our attachment, you know, like when we when we look in development, we can avoid uh, attachment issues. We can be anxious attachment or insecure avoidant attachment, which means, you know, where if we have not had good attachments growing up, we may have difficulty um, forming these attachments and difficulty trusting our world. Um, in fact, if it's insecure or avoidant, we may avoid making contact with other people altogether or getting close to them because we've been hurt in the past and it can cause those kinds of issues. Of course, ostracism is the idea of being shut out. We've all been shut out of, of things at time. You know, there's so, cyber ostracism. Cyber ostracism is that, you know, you put up a, a Facebook post and no one likes it or a picture and no one likes it. It makes us feel bad. It brings our idea down. And, and in fact, this pain that we feel from ostracism is the same as actual pain. Uh, in fact, a lot of the drugs that we take for headaches and stuff will actually help alleviate this pain to a point. Um, the anterior cingulate cortex, which is a brain cluster or a cluster of cells in your brain, seems to be activated in both these cases, and it will definitely influence our behavior. Um, you know, also when we ostrac when we are ostracized, um, girls often use this at younger ages in order to bully other girls. You know, they'll have a sleepover party and make sure that the one that they're trying to bully knows that they're not involved, and it's very hurtful being ostracized from the rest of the group. So now we've kind of increased this whole thing because we all have cell phones. In fact, um, in some countries, in parts of India, there are actually more cell phones than there are uh, plumbing inside of houses. Cell phones are very common. In fact, you know, you probably find around our school and a lot of schools in North America especially that, you know, probably well over 90% of students have a cell phone. So it's like you have friends with you all the time. Okay, and we have texting and email and Facebook and Twitter and, and it's all the time. You know, is this a good thing or a bad thing? You know, it can lead us to having difficulties in face relations, but it also leads to the idea that we are always connected and we tend to rely on these connections and some more than others where we actually it forms like an addiction that we have. There's a, a feeling of wanting to be included that is so strong it works just like a drug addiction. Um, you know, when we lead into other things, you know, like um, social dating sites, and we will look a lot closer at social dating sites in a future future video, um, but they are definitely a way a lot of people are meeting their potential mates now. So we're more or less socially isolated. When you're at home, you know, tweeting to all your friends or texting and stuff are you actually alone or are you socially isolated obviously you're sharing information so it makes us feel better which is causes that drug type of relationship um, does it stimulate healthy self-disclosure and we do find um, that a lot of times we are more like willing to disclose um, things about ourselves when we're not actually face to face with someone because we can't recognize the emotional response that we have from a person. Okay, so that may be healthy and in fact we find in relationships on social dating sites that people have met on social dating sites, um, a lot of times their relationships become successful uh, more than if we had met in person and a lot of it is because of self-disclosure is a little bit easier on social media. Um, but, you know, do our posts actually reflect our personalities or do we clean that up and make ourselves look like somebody we're not? And that can. The other thing is narcissism. Does this promote narcissism? You know, we take, you know, people that take thousands of selfies and post them for everybody, you know, like, we're, you know what? We're tired of seeing all your selfies. You're beautiful. Stop taking all those selfies. Okay. Um. But that can promote narcissism, especially when we get likes for them all the time. That's why I stopped posting on my selfies because I get, you know, like 10,000 likes all at once. And it just, it just became monotonous. So I don't do that anymore. So with all these things, you know, we have the effect of social networking and we have our, our general base uh, drives and things we have for hunger, sex, you know, sex and for, you know, drinking, all those motivations. And we'll look closer at emotions in the next video. Okay, so we will see you guys in class next day. Bye for now.